This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Masks and vaccinations aren't the only measures to minimize virus spread and hospitalizations because of COVID-19. Contact tracing is an important public health tool. 18 months into this pandemic, how is contact tracing still being used? And is it helping? Nearly all of Connecticut's counties are considered high transmission areas right now, according to the CDC. That means there are 100 or more cases per 100,000 people, or a positivity rate of 10% or higher over the past seven days. Today, where we live, we hear from contact tracers and talk to national and local public health experts. And we want to hear from you, too. Have you or a family member been contacted by a contact tracer? Did you have any concerns about sharing information with public health workers? You can join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. Or you can find us on Facebook and Twitter, at Where We Live. Now, we've been talking a lot about contact tracing over the last uh, year and a half. But right now, we're going to talk to people that actually did the work, uh, first starting with Michael Luongo, who's a journalist. And most recently, he worked as a community engagement specialist for New York City Health and Hospitals COVID Test and Trace Program. Michael, welcome to the show. Hi, Lucy. It's great to be here. Thank you. So uh, you you were a contact tracer. How did you get into this uh, during the pandemic? So, uh, you know, I'm a journalist. I also used to work in the HIV field uh, many years ago. And some of the principles with HIV work uh, are similar to COVID work. A um, friend had tweeted about a job position uh, for COVID test and trace in New York City. And she mentioned in her tweet, you know, talking to people who don't want to talk to you, figuring out their lives, interviewing them. Uh, she said, this is what journalists do. And at the time, there was very little journalism work, so I decided to apply. Um, and after a bit of a process, um, I started as a COVID tracer in July of last year. Now, we know, depending on the state, contact tracing programs uh, can differ somewhat. And so for New York City, what did the job entail exactly? So I was a community engagement specialist, and what that meant is that if by phone we couldn't reach you or we had incorrect information, including addresses, phone numbers, uh, misspelled names, um, which is where investigative uh, skills come into play, we'd have to go visit people in their homes. Um, we did that before the vaccine existed, so we, we did go with you know masks, uh, shields, gloves, constantly sanitizing. Um, and what we would do is if, if we couldn't reach you by phone, we'd go visit you, we would do a survey. What New York City did was a daily survey of anyone in the city who tested positive for COVID or was listed as exposed to COVID. And so we wanted to make sure that we tracked people found out what their needs were. The city also had a lot of things like food programs, medicine programs, helping you get onto insurance um, to make it easier for you to stay at home, um, but also to make sure that you were okay. That must have been really challenging when we look back and saw the number of cases in New York City alone uh, in mm -hmm. the middle of this pandemic. And so how did people respond to you when you showed up at their doorstep? So there would be days where we would have up to 18 cases at the height of everything. And I know from my, my colleagues, my former colleagues now with the Delta variant, um, cases have shot up again tremendously. Um, some people were very happy. My territory, I lived in Washington Heights, uh, northern Manhattan. So my territory was Washington Heights, Inwood, and Harlem. So the northern part of Manhattan, though we'd go to other areas. Most people were happy um, when we showed up. Um, as one colleague put it, you know, when you have COVID, you feel very alone and isolated, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic. And we were this sort of lifeline showing up to them when they were marooned on an island. Um, some people were not happy. Some people did feel it was an invasion of privacy. But I think for the most part, people were pleased that we showed up, if not a bit apprehensive. Sometimes they would have privacy issues. They were sometimes reluctant to give additional contacts. Um, but I think when people found out that there were more ways we could help them and make it easier for them to isolate. Um, 
or quarantine, then that made it easier. Sometimes you'd show up, and in particular for mothers of households, you would come to a very crowded apartment. And I mean, there'd be like eight children and several generations of a family crowded into one and two bedroom apartments, particularly in that in my area of Manhattan. So each family was different um, and often had different challenges. Uh, and for the most part, people did not mind that we came, even if we were surprised, they were surprised. I would say that if the city had done a bit of a better job letting people know about contact tracing, um, as good of a job as they did for vaccinations and for other things, I think people would have been a little, ap little less apprehensive when they were apprehensive. Mm -hmm. When you talk about apprehension and, you know, the fact that you're a stranger showing up, they don't know you, you don't know them. I mean, how do you get people to open up? Um, as I mentioned, contact tracing, a long time public health tool, but for people, uh, many people not in public health, uh, you know, before this pandemic, maybe no one ever even heard of this, this idea of isolating contacts and trying to you know, stem the transmission of this virus. So I think in New York, almost Almost no one in New York does not know someone who died of COVID. So I think in a way, most people know the serious nature of what we did. Uh, Washington Heights in particular was one of the most impacted parts of the world um, in terms of its deaths, in terms of, um, you know, how quickly it went through the neighborhood, uh, particularly the Latino um, areas in, in the neighborhood. So I think in that sense, most people knew the seriousness of it. It is New York, so most people really don't want to necessarily open the door for a stranger. Um, but I think once people realize who we are, we had badges, um, you know, very often they were worried about infecting us. So sometimes we would talk through the door. Uh, we would talk through a gap in the door. Um, it would really depend. Sometimes what we also had were letters asking people to give us a call back. Um, and so there were different ways where we protected ourselves. We also made things a little bit easier for the people that we visited. And if they were apprehensive, they could give a phone call. We would sometimes have to go back to people a couple times um, before they would call us back, before they realized, you know, sometimes the first time somebody shows up at your door, you may not believe them. But after two or three times of visits, you start to believe that this is real. We're talking to contact tracers today here on Where We Live. It's still an important public health tool as we're still living in this pandemic. You're hearing on Zoom with me Michael Luongo, who's a journalist, and recently he worked as a community engagement specialist for the New York City Health and Hospitals COVID Test and Trace Program. In a couple of minutes, we're going to hear from a contact tracer um, who's doing the work here in Connecticut. But, you know, Michael, I'm wondering, uh, in your New York uh, or NBC news piece that you mm -hmm. uh, wrote, you also talked about the challenge challenge uh, when people uh, weren't telling the truth about testing yeah. positive. Can you talk a little bit more about that? So I think this is a really important issue. And of course, I do know this from working in the HIV field, and uh, we know this from other illnesses. There are stigmas to having illnesses. Um, so sometimes people are not truthful about, um, for obvious reasons, because of stigma. Uh, and, and other issues. And unfortunately, this is a politicized uh, virus. It should not be politicized, but they can be, unfortunately. Um, but we would show up to people's houses or people's apartments, and there are times when they ignored us, because the calls, because they did not want their family to know that they had tested positive. So there were quite a few cases, but in the NBC News uh, think piece that I had done, I mentioned two specific cases. One was a young man who tested positive. The family had made a decision that if they all tested together and all tested negative, they would not wear masks at home. The mother, I don't remember what her specific illness was, but she was immunocompromised. So the son tested positive, but told the family that he tested negative, uh, as the rest of them had done. So he put his mother at risk, unfortunately. She, she, she could have died, uh, but he did not want her to know that he had snuck out of the house uh, and hung out with somebody who 
did test positive for COVID, and that's how he got infected. So there was an argument when I arrived because that was when the family learned of his diagnosis um, or his, his testing positive. Um, ultimately, uh, we were able to quell the issue. So this is something that can happen. In another case, I can't say for sure that the husband was not, in many ways, COVID is sexually transmitted. Uh, it, it can be transmitted through kissing, through intimacy. Um, and it seemed to me that the denials of a husband that I had come to visit, that he said he never left the house, that he never tested pie, he never went for a test, how could I show up? Um, his wife and children were there. Um, and his protests made me realize that there was something else going on. And my assumption, which could or could be incorrect, but seemed from the way in which he denied things, that he may have not been faithful to his wife and got COVID that way, or mm. in some way he snuck out of the house. So these are the things that we do come across and why people try to hide their diagnosis um, and why contact tracing is really important. Um, one could argue that this is a privacy issue, but this is how an illness can spread. Um, we try not to let family members know, but if we come and the whole family's there and I'm trying to talk with you, they will, they of course can overhear what, what we are saying. Right. So those are two examples that really stuck out in my mind where people were asymptomatic. We've often heard that term. And because they were asymptomatic, they could hide their diagnosis, but that put their family members at risk. Mm. I wanted to get the perspective of a contact tracer working for the state of Connecticut's Department of Public Health. Uh, Leah Zimini is joining us on Zoom. Leah, welcome to the show. Good morning. Happy to be here. Thank you for so, having me. Uh, Connecticut's program uh, is set up uh, differently than what we heard uh, Michael describe when he worked as a, a community outreach specialist for the New York City Health and Hospitals program. And so uh, tell us uh, how it's set up and how you got involved, Leah. Um, I got involved um, after being previously laid off um, after a shutdown at my, my former job and um, looking for work and realized this was an opportunity just as the state was um, starting their, their hiring process to bring folks on. And um, I have experience in healthcare, um, working in elder care as a recreation therapist for many years. Um, and so this seemed like something I could do um, working remotely from home to try to make a difference at a time where um, I'm sure you all can relate. You know, I was feeling otherwise pretty helpless about this um, and I didn't know what I could do to, to help or make a difference. Um, and right. this, this was it. And the, the State Department of Public Health, do they contract with a, a company that can find contract tracers like you, Leah? Is that how it works? They do. They set up with a with a, a healthcare staffing company, and um, they brought us on. They they did all the hiring, and they really put together quite a great diverse group of folks. And the nice thing is, all of us are residents of Connecticut here, and so we are in the same boat as the, the rest of the folks in the state. So we are just concerned residents reaching out to the other residents here of the state wanting to make sure people have the information they need, the support they need. Um, and, you know, we want to make a difference. We want to try to mitigate the spread of the virus. Mm -hmm. At this point in the pandemic, uh, for people that you may be reaching out to, Leah, uh, to find out who their close contacts are, do they understand contact tracing? And do you even get to that uh, point? Do they respond to the voicemails, the phone calls? Yeah, you, you, there's a variety of responses there. I would say the majority of the residents of the state are appreciative of our efforts and they do have an understanding um, of why we're calling and what we're doing. Um, you know, when we are in a public health crisis, um, you know, the, it can be a volatile situation and 
Um, as Michael was saying, you know, there could be sort of an element of, of shame or wanting to keep it a secret, um, you know, which is unfortunate because th there is no shame involved here. This We're all dealing with this. Um, and so, you know, when people pick up the call, um, which most do, um, you know, that's where tracing makes a difference. When people actually pick up the call, follow through, understand what it is we're trying to do here, that we are trying to help, that we are trying to make sure that our residents have what they need to successfully stay either isolated or quarantined to minimize any spread, um, then it works. Um, it is unfortunate that some folks, you know, um, don't want to participate for whatever their reasons are, um, and they may not answer the call. We do make multiple attempts, um, but at the same time, you know, we, we have quite a caseload, as was mentioned, cases are on the rise. Um, so we, we make a, numerous attempts to each person, and then, you know, we have to move on. So if someone is not receptive to our call, you know, we are, we are moving on to the next person because we want to be addressing this with a sense of urgency to make sure that we're getting in touch with people as soon as possible. Mm. When we, uh, when you know that someone has a positive uh, COVID test and you're reaching out to them to get a list of their close contacts, you know, how many people does that mean in terms of how the work that you're doing that eventually you'll be reaching out to how many people related to this one particular individual? Yeah, I mean, that can really vary depending on, you know, how, how much someone has been out and about in their community. Some folks say, I, I never leave the house. I don't know how this happened. Um you know, and other folks have just been going about their lives and have, have been in contact with, with quite a few people potentially. So it really varies. Um, I, I am not really uh, dealing so much with those numbers and the analysis of them as I am focused on making sure that the quality of our work um, is, is top notch and that we are taking the time to make sure that each person we do reach out to who is receptive to our call has the correct CD guidelines, has a chance to ask their questions if they have them, and just has a chance to know that, you know, the residents of the state and, and the state themselves, they care about people and they want to make sure they have what they need. So as far as, you know, actual numbers, it, it really differs depending on the person. Um, but it, it, it's a constant workload, I'll tell you that. And we do make an effort to reach 100% of the contacts who are noted to us as exposures when we do speak with a case. So um, that, that is the goal, is to reach everybody and try to get that information out. And Leah, you mentioned that we know that unfortunately cases are rising in our state and officials point to the Delta variant being the cause. Kids are going back to school, uh, college students are back on campus. And so how are you preparing for this surge? Uh, we, we did reach out to the Department of Public Health to get an idea of how many contact tracers the state has and the spokesman did not get back to us uh, with a response. But you know, how are you dealing with this caseload? Uh, we're just buckling down and and forging ahead. You know, I've, I've been doing this for about a year now. Um, we work, um, you know, side by side with the local health departments. Um, so we have not only our state contact tracers, but all of the people involved in the local health departments who are working at this. We have volunteers helping out. Uh, so all hands are on deck. And, you know, we're, we're, we're treating this the same as we have this entire time and you know the same element of, of urgency to want to get to people and uh, the focus on you know quality of work is important so I you know we haven't really done much different on our end as far as how we're handling the surge other than to just you know s stick to it and keep forging ahead with this and making sure we're getting that information out um, and it's it, it, it does make a difference, but, you know, people have to take that call. Um, and right. unfortunately, there has been somewhat of a decrease in willingness to to participate in the program. And I do suspect a lot of that is attached to COVID fatigue, uh, not necessarily wanting to, to talk about COVID um, anymore. Um, un unfortunately, you have some families where Perhaps the COVID came through their home, maybe over the winter or during the holidays, and they've experienced that. And, and now perhaps with the Delta variant, it's, it's come into their household again. And, um, you know, they, 
they, they don't want to talk about it anymore. Um, but I just want to assure everybody that, you know, we're, our calls um, are being made to reach out and make sure that folks have what they need and they have that knowledge. Um, there's, there's nothing to be um, avoidant about with our calls and also assure folks that your information is kept private and confidential and it is only being used to help mitigate the spread of this virus and to make sure that you and your family have what it is that you need to either stay isolated or quarantined. Well, Leah, thank you for your work, uh, and we appreciate you sharing uh, your experiences as a contact tracer uh, for the Connecticut Department of Public Health. That was Leah Zimini. Also with us today was Michael Luongo, a journalist who most recently worked as a community engagement specialist for New York City's Health and Hospitals COVID test and trace program. You're listening to Where We Live. Coming up, we're going to hear how other states are managing these programs, and we want to hear from you. Have you or a family member received a call from a contact tracer? What was that experience like? You can join us, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We just heard why contact tracing is an important public health tool, but what other measures are states using and, and how are these programs managing with COVID-19 cases spiking across the country? The Associated Press reports states are hiring new staff and seeking out volunteers to bolster the ranks of contact tracers that have been overwhelmed by surging coronavirus cases. Coming up, we'll hear more from a reporter for CT News Junkie about Connecticut's contact tracing tracing program. For a national perspective, joining us now on Zoom is Hamie Tawarson, Executive Director of the National Academy for State Health Policy. Hamie, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, we know that contact tracing in the past has successfully contained the spread of infectious diseases. According uh, to uh, studies uh, released, you know, rapid identification and isolation of each new case and quarantine of contacts who are potentially infected were key interventions effectively eliminating secondary transmission resulting from Ebola virus back in 2014. Uh, and these authors go on to say that uh, in this pandemic, contact tracing had never been needed on such a large scale in the U.S. So how pre prepared were states for this, uh, these surges, uh, Amy? Yeah, well, um, you know, this is an unprecedented pandemic with a lot of challenges that none of us expected. So, you know, early in the pandemic, um, we saw a lot of states really trying to ramp up contact tracing and implement programs because really the rate of the infections were so high and they just didn't have the staff um, to keep up with the, the number of folks infected. So I think there were a lot of challenges early on um, with respect to not just staffing, but there was also delays in testing. So, you know, back in March, April, May, June, you know, last year, um, there were a large number of cases and the testing took longer for results to come back. So you were waiting for a couple of days and people had to decide, OK, you know, on, our, on my honor, I'm going to wait, you know, and quarantine myself. Not everybody did that. And then you weren't really able to reach out to the contacts until you had that positive test. Thankfully, where we are now is we have much more rapid tests available to us on a much more wide scale basis. So I think there's a potential for um, at least getting out to those who've been exposed to the individual. It will be a more efficient process. I'll also say, um, I think, you know, last summer, there was some hope that the contact tracing could really stem the curve. And, and it is an important tool in sort of controlling the pandemic. But in some states, even with them hiring up and reaching out, they just didn't have the community penetration that was needed. And I think we heard about this earlier in the program of, you know, some folks not engaging, um, not having enough staff to reach all the folks who needed to get reached. And so, um, you know, some states double down and continue to really invest and expand their programs and other states kind of stayed, you know, steady or even reduced over time um, the number of contact tracers they hired. I think we're seeing a resurgence now in the interest in contact tracing, especially in areas like schools, um, businesses, 
and um, some other sort of communities where, you know, states know that there are folks that, that remain unvaccinated. So, so I do think we see some states, again, reinvesting in the contact tracing workforce, et cetera. Um, the other thing I'll just note, and you're probably going to ask me about this, um, was the, the phone apps. And I think last summer there was a real hope that people would, you know, download these apps, get notifications electronically, which would really save on sort of the manpower of actually, you know, reaching out to folks, calling them or showing up in person. Um, there really wasn't the uptake of the phone apps that that I think one hoped last summer. And I think that's still true now. Um, so, you know, whether whether this is going to be something that could be a future tool, I think there's some universities that are hoping at least within their campuses, they could maybe um, interest college students or university students to use the phone app, but more broadly, it really hasn't had the uptake that we all thought could be useful. I'm glad you brought that up because in January, uh, the state announced that there were more than 1 million downloads of the state's contact tracing phone app. Uh, so about a third of our state. Uh, and then we haven't really heard much about that program since. And so that's interesting. Lots of downloads, but maybe uh, not a lot of use, as you've just mentioned. Yeah. And, you know, um, not speaking specifically to Connecticut, but just across the states, you know, we've heard from a number of state leaders that, you know, even if the folks downloaded it, there wasn't sort of active use or some, you know, especially the summer deleted the app. Um, so, you know, it's really unclear whether that is going to be an effective part of the contact tracing. I think, you know, some of the folks that we've talked to is it's still the phone call and the showing up in person um, where they're really feeling like they can be sure that folks are actually um, getting the information that they need. Mm-hmm. Uh, we spoke to Kaiser Health News in March, um, and when they talk about the hollowing out of public health departments nationwide, uh, the reporter telling us at least 38,000 state and local public health jobs have disappeared since the recession, leaving a skeletal workforce for what was once viewed as one of the world's top public health systems. And so that's where we are, this uh, fragmented system that we have, some states able to invest more than others. And now we're seeing spikes uh, throughout our country. I mean, what are some challenges that you see, Hamie, moving forward? Yeah, um, you know, with public health, I mean, we have we have underinvested in public health for years, um, and that, that was, I think, made clear or you know, really exposed um, during this pandemic. So, you know, in addition to contact tracing, just for public health um, across the board, I do think there's going to be the need for more investment, and we do have federal funds flowing, um, you know, from the American Relief Plan Act and other sources. So there are opportunities to try to really think about how to modernize public health and connect it to other parts of our healthcare system and really improve um, what we can do um, for folks in public health. But I think there's a lot of work ahead and we're still in the midst of this pandemic. Um, I think, you know, many of us were hoping we'd have a break during the summer and, you know, we'd see surges maybe, you know, late fall, winter, and it came a lot earlier than expected. So, so I think, you know, states are again scrambling um, to try to get control and mitigate um, the Delta variant and other variants that are going to emerge and get the vaccination rates et cetera, up. So I think there, there are a lot of challenges ahead. Um, I personally am very concerned about um, schools, especially with those under 12 who just are not eligible for vaccination. We want to keep the kids in school. Contact tracing and testing are going to be a key um, tool to those to be able to do that. And so you know, I hope um, states and localities are going to be able to have um, the staffing and the resources available to do that. Uh, we know that the CDC awarded Connecticut uh, $17 million to its state health department. Uh, that grant, the two-year grant uh, to reduce COVID-19 related health disparities and improve and increase contact tracing and testing among high-risk underserved populations. And so that, that sounds uh, promising, but when we're out of this, you know, what happens to that investment, Hamie? Yeah, you know, um, there is a lot of money flowing to states um, right now. And so I think states are really thinking about how to make the investments, you know, through 2026, which is when the, the funds expire. But it's a good question. What happens afterwards? And, you know, I think what, what hopefully we'll have some lessons learned from all of this. So there can be some smart investments made um, for sustainability. But I do think, you know, beyond kind of that like we don't want a cliff in 2026 of like, okay, we've been through this. Okay, now we're done. We really do want to prepare for the potential next pandemic. So we're not um, in the same situation that we found ourselves in during COVID-19. I will also say just um, a note, you know, for those 
more underserved communities, you know, things like quarantine and isolation are really difficult. I think, you know, we heard earlier from Michael, you know, multiple folks in a, in one apartment, you know, it's hard to miss work. Um, It's hard to, you know, be able to afford a hotel to go isolate. I mean, these are things that are real to people. And so, you know, part of um, effective contact tracing, isolation, quarantine is providing, you know, resources for food and hotel and monetary incentives to to go isolate because it's not always um, easily available for for some communities to be able to do that. So so I do think, you know, thinking about like, how do we address future pandemics? It's thinking about what are the pieces that are going to be helpful to be able to kind of flip to easily um, if we had another pandemic that, that comes our way. Are there any examples before we let you go, Hamy, of uh, localities or states that are doing uh, contact tracing well? Yeah. So, you know, New England has had a couple of examples of, of states that have really invested in contact tracing and, and really tried to, to use this as a tool. Connecticut is one of them. Um, there's also Massachusetts and Maine are two other states in the New England area that, that really did invest in contact tracing and continue to, to try to build upon that as we kind of face the new Delta variant. Um, we don't know all of the information. We actually are going to be partnering here um, at Nashby with Mathematica to do an evaluation of state contact tracing programs. So we should have more information on that soon. Well, Hamid Tawarson, we'd love to have you back uh, to tell us what you find out in terms of of how these programs are working and whether they're robust enough as we continue to deal with this pandemic. Hamid, again, is Executive Director of the National Academy for State Health Policy. Thanks for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. You're listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. Coming up, we're going to hear from a local health director in Connecticut. What challenges remain as COVID cases continue to spike in our state? And we'll get more uh, details on Connecticut's contact tracing program from a reporter with CT News Junkie. Stay with us. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up tomorrow, two Democrats in New Britain hope to challenge four-term incumbent Mayor Aaron Stewart in November. On the next Where We Live, we talk to State Representative Bobby Sanchez and Alicia Hernandez-Strong, who will be on the ballot in next month's primary. Do you live in New Britain? What questions do you have for them? You can join us. That's tomorrow, Where We Live. Now, we've heard how public health officials in different states have used people and data to help curb the number of COVID-19 cases. We want to hear more about the steps being taken in Connecticut. Joining us now on Zoom is Emily DeSalvo. She's a freelance reporter for CT News Junkie. Emily, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So you had done some reporting at the start of the year. Uh, Back then, only 55% of people testing positive could be reached by contact tracers working in Connecticut. What's it looking like now? Yeah, so data is reported every couple of weeks, and the most recent numbers that I have were from August 15th through August 27th, and that data is saying that 50% of positive cases that were contacted were successfully reached, and 63% of contacts were successfully reached, which sounds a little bit better with the 63%, but when you think about the number of people that are not being reached, that's still quite concerning. Um, our producer, Sujata Srinivasan, when she reached out to the State Department of Health, uh, she found out that uh, the state has extended its contact tracing program to May of next year. Originally, it was going to transition to local health departments uh, right around now. And so I'm just curious about the manpower that the state has to do this important work, Emily. Yeah, so originally they were contracted with a and Health, which is um, just a company that supplies a workforce. And at the time in January, they had 310 staff and volunteers um, that were directed under the local health departments. And then they had um, 270 paid staff in the statewide pool. The plan when the contract was going to expire was to be to slowly kind of turn the work over to local health departments. But with the spike in the Delta variant, it became very clear that that plan wasn't going to suffice. While local health departments have been um, 
increasing the number of people that they have doing contact tracing, the state is going to be continuing their their program as well, just because the need is becoming uh, quite great. With us on Zoom as well as Kevin Elak, Acting Director for the Middletown Department of Health. Uh, Kevin, welcome. Good morning, Lucy. So tell us, uh, we know that Middletown is currently in a red risk level for community transmission of COVID. Seven out of eight counties in our state uh, have similar numbers, unfortunately. And so how does contact tracing, how's it been working locally in your city? Uh, I think it's been uh, quite well. Uh, You know, uh, I think Connecticut overall, uh, uh, you know, to the Department of Public Health has done a very good job with building it up. As you heard from, uh, uh, you know, Leah, who's doing uh, contact tracing for the state, um, they've uh, brought on a pool of uh, contact tracers uh, through an independent company, uh, and then also through some of that uh, uh, federal funding that trickled down to uh, the state. Uh, that came to local health departments, where we were able to. Uh, hire some uh, part-time uh, contact tracers uh, to handle that surge as well. So, um, you know, as the waves ebbed and flowed, uh, we kind of had to scale up and down the people who are doing contact tracing. Um, and, and kind of uh, the, the problem with that sometimes is when there's not enough contact tracing, uh, we have those people doing uh, other things like maybe data entry for our vaccine clinics. But to really... Uh, be an effective contact tracer, you have to uh, do it all the time. And it takes a lot of practice, as we heard from Michael uh, Luongo earlier, uh, that uh, you have to be part of, you know, customer service and investigative journalist and part detective or epidemiologist. So it takes uh, a lot of different skills uh, to be able to be an, an effective contact tracer. So specifically in Middletown, how many people who test positive for COVID are your contact tracers reaching? So overall, I looked at our data for the past month, and this is this is also including uh, contacts that have been identified. Uh, we are successfully monitoring about forty-one percent of those. Uh, so those are, you know, maybe people that we did were able to reach out to, um, but for some reason or another, they opted out of. Uh, Continuing with the with the daily monitoring of contact tracing, um, you know our numbers show that about 31% of the uh, calls that we make uh, that we either uh, you know 11% of those we have are, are aren't able to reach out to people or get in touch with them. Either we don't have very good phone numbers for them or uh, uh, for whatever one reason or another, and others you know we've tried several times to to attempt to contact them, but do not receive calls back. So for uh, residents of Middletown who may be listening right now, you know, what can you tell them about the process? And so if they were to get a phone call from a contact tracer, uh, if they're positive for COVID, you know, how to convince them that this is the thing that you need to do to help the community at large? Yeah, so uh, contact tracing has been one of those, you know, that's constant since uh, I believe we started this around, you know, March of uh, 2020, um, that is one of the most effective, you know, non-pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, So, uh, you know, as Leah mentioned earlier, um, it's something that we, that our contact tracers and we, through, of course, public service announcements, try to get out to the community that participating in contact tracing is so crucial and uh, you know, information, uh, as Leah mentioned before, is uh, it's confidential. So uh, people's names are never shared with, with anybody else. Uh, even if we have to, you know, if a contact is identified through it, through the uh, uh, interview, that their information, private information, is never shared with anybody else. We just notify people that they've uh, been identified as a close contact to somebody else. So, uh, um, and again, that sometimes takes a little bit of discussion and, you know, there has to be some trust built between uh, the person on the uh, other end of the line and the contact tracer to establish that uh, comfort level and trust. 
You'd said earlier about four out of 10 uh, residents who test positive for COVID are actually successfully contacted. Uh, and so that's, you know, just trying to get them to even answer the phone or uh, re respond to that voicemail. That's the first challenge. That's correct. And, uh, and even then, uh, there's varying degrees of how much information they're willing to share. Uh, the, uh, the program we use, uh, Contact, is called. I wish they thought of a different name for that. So it was confusing. <laughs> but um, it, it's actually a very, very good program that attempts to capture a lot of information. So we so we really try to get as much information and including, uh, you know, trying to find out from people perhaps where they might have become infected, whether it be a uh, traveling or attending a large gathering, um, their vaccination status, you know, if they go to school somewhere. Um, so uh, we really try to capture a lot of information um, from there, but sometimes people, uh, and, and a lot of these interviews can take anywhere from, you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, even an hour. And that's, uh, uh, you know, a lot of asking a lot sometimes from people. So we want to make sure that when we do have them on the phone, we're capturing as much information as we can. But at some point people, uh, might decide to turn it off and say, I, I really don't want to provide any more information. Um, and, and what we find is that uh, people do share their contacts for their people in the household. So uh, they, you know, they'll be very upfront as far as who lives in the household, but they're a little more reluctant to share who, you know, who maybe they've been in contact with outside the home, whether it be a a co-worker or a friend or something like that. You're hearing Kevin Elak here on Where We Live, Acting Director for the Middletown Department of Health, as we learn more about contact tracing on the local level. So, Kevin, how many contact tracers does Middletown have, and do you anticipate uh, bringing on more because of this uh, latest surge with Delta? So right now we have uh, five people who do it. Uh, most of those are, uh, are people that we brought on part-time, uh, through uh, the grant funding from the state. Uh, and one person actually is a volunteer. Uh, so uh, we, we do have the capacity to scale it up and down uh, depending on uh, what, you know, the conditions that are going out in the community. Um, we do plan on bringing uh, two more people who actually will be doing COVID uh, testing, but when things are quieter with that, we can also have them do contact tracing as well. Mm -hmm. um, but like I'm I mentioned you, before, uh, Kevin, I'm glad you brought that up. That was something I wanted to to ask you is when we think about, you know, the push to um, continue to encourage people to get the COVID vaccine, health departments have a lot on their plate. And so when we think about um, vaccination efforts versus contact tracing, you know, there's a, there's a lot that you have to handle. And do you have the right enough resources to do this work? Uh, it's been a challenge <laughs> this whole time. Uh, and I think, you know, I, the towns have done a, we've done a pretty good job. I have to say, you know, as mentioned earlier that public health has been underfunded for uh, a number of years. And, you know, we've been uh, fortunate to have some of this uh, funding, federal funding uh, come down, trickle down to the local health departments to help, uh, again, hire some people on the part-time basis. But eventually that's going to dry up. And I, I, we don't really know what's going to happen after that. We're all trying to, uh, I think, demonstrate to our municipal leaders that having these people on right now, uh, perhaps that's something that can be uh, brought on uh, even after that money dries up and after the pandemic. Emily DeSalvo is still with us, a freelance reporter for CT News Junkie. In your reporting, Emily, I know we're talking specifically to Kevin out of Middletown, but, you know, different health departments and health districts are staffed differently. Do you get the impression that these health departments and health districts all understand how that contact program works that the state is using? Um, there's, there's certainly a level of confusion sometimes in terms of which cases the state is going to take versus which cases the local health district is going to take. I spoke to a contact tracer in Wallingford who kind of didn't really even know that the state was doing contact tracing. Um, she kind of thought it was only a local thing at this point. So um, the understanding that I also got from another district was that 
the state gives the local districts 24 hours to pick up the, the case and contact trace it. And then if not, it gets shot back to the state. And that's different than how it was earlier in the pandemic when the state had like a heavier hand in terms of, of um, picking up the cases. Um, I think that for now, like the local health districts are basically trying to balance people in their workforce that are actually doing other things at the same time. Like they're a nurse who's also a contact tracer or they're a health educator who's also a contact tracer. So while they're maybe doing the brunt of the work, they're also busy people. Uh, Kim and, and Emily, thank you for that, because I was thinking even before this pandemic, what health departments were doing, and that is lead testing, uh, you know, doing health inspections at restaurants and um, doing other uh, community health awareness programs for residents. And again, there's a lot there that a health department is responsible for. And this pandemic has uh, taken up a lot of your time and resources for good reason. Right. But it can be challenging. Yes, and particularly when vaccines were more in demand at that point in time, um, they were very busy because they were having these vaccine clinics and things like that, and then would have to go and deal with these calls. However, now vaccines are kind of down and cases are up. So the type of workforce that they need uh, continues to shift, which is why districts like Kevin was saying, they're very flexible about where people are when who's the contact tracer, who's doing another job at that time. So it's just really an evolving um, system that's uh, increasingly decentralized. And Kevin, last question for you. We know that the state had provided funding for assistance to people for to isolate themselves, right? If they tested positive and they need to quarantine, so maybe providing money for a hotel stay or providing food. Has that continued? Yeah, so uh, you're referring to the community resource coordinators, and that's been an absolutely fantastic program uh, that's uh, been available. And and I think even that program has even helped with contact tracing because uh, during the course of that interview with somebody, there's questions asked if people have, uh, you know, can they can they you know adequately isolate or quarantine in their home, or do they have food uh, so they don't have to maybe go out to the grocery store or do they uh, have adequate medical needs do they have you know access to to um, medical services uh, so those are the questions that the contact tracers ask and then they uh, refer those people uh, to if if they agree to that to these community resource coordinators uh, so my understanding is that that was going to end uh, but it's been extended at least for another month now well, Kevin Elak, we appreciate your time as acting director of the Middletown Department of Health uh, for talking about it from uh, the local perspective. We appreciate your time. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, you're so welcome. And Emily DeSalvo is here, a reporter for CT News Junkie. Emily, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show produced by Sujata Srinivasan. Kat Pastor is our technical producer. We hope you join us tomorrow.